Well, I think that this is the last. I hope that not the least. <laughs> and um, of course, uh, first of all, uh, I work for CESGA, so uh, it was a pleasure to have you here. Um, I hope that you learn a lot during these days. So um, I try to um, to talk a little bit about uh, the join between HPC and deep learning. Uh, for the HPC community, really, deep learning is uh, it was uh, an explosion during the last two years, maybe three years. So we are trying to understand now uh, really the, the needs of the uh, machine learning community and the resources and, and this kind of thing. So uh, I will present here an ongoing work that we are doing in order to understand better uh, what are the resources that we need and uh, the kind of performance that we can is, uh, we can get from the API and from the and from the um, um, supercomputer that we operate. So this is the line that is not an index. It's more or less I will present very very fast what Cesca is, so you can uh, um, understand better why we are uh, working in this area. And later we will explore some uh, details about the machine learning. I don't know if. Uh, who knows something about machine learning? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, oh, yeah, a lot. So maybe I will not explain nothing new to you, but uh, I hope. <laughs> well, what's CESGA? We are here in Santiago, so, but uh, CESGA is not really the bus this building. It's one building that is uh, maybe 40 meters from here. If you want to visit uh, after the, this small workshop, talk to me or many other people from CESGA that are here, and we can organize a small visit uh, on FATS because it's Friday, of course. But uh, that is more important. We are, a we are a public foundation. We are not part of the one of the university. We are not part of, uh, we are not a company. Our role is to promote the computing and the high performance communication in order to create new business, new research, new capabilities for the society. So uh, this is a key point because we are here now working in this area, but as soon as we have a provider in outside that provides the same services, we have to stop because our role uh, in this case has finished. Uh, we currently provide many services, not only supercomputers, we provide communication, we provide uh, e-learning systems, we provide uh, geographical information systems, everything that one research from our community, from Spain or, or from Galicia can need for uh, making research. In fact, we operate our network that is part of the National Academic Network that is based on dark fiber. So we can manage the traffic on, on the network and increase, the, for example, the bandwidth because the, we can illuminate one lambda to create a, an appropriate network for one experiment. And in fact, we provide a backup network for, to Portugal uh, because Portugal now has two connections to the European Academic Network, one from here, from Galicia, and another one from the South of Spain. And that is the most important point. We work mainly for the academic sector, for the universities, for the research centers, but we work also for the companies, for the small companies that create innovations, that uh, are creating new products to, or new services to deliver to the market and also to hospitals or any other institution, profit or non-profit, that uh, wants to create a new service based on high performance communication of high performance computing. And to deliver this one, and we'll stop here. I will stop here for a, a couple of minutes. I will try to explain that we provide many kind of different computer uh, systems. Of course, the best one, and uh, maybe the bigger one that we have is Fenerstrai 2, that uh, if you have been there yesterday, it's a supercomputer with 300 nodes, uh, 24 cores per node, and with uh, some uh, GPUs and some uh, same fees because we want to create a hybrid system that can be used for many different communities. The system has a, a last file system that with a, a very high speed connection using InfiniBand FDR. But of course, we have another services like, for example, this one devoted to HTC, or we have a cloud for uh, industry that is a specific 
uh, for this university and another one for uh, the community. And we have a big, a big data platform also that is based on the architecture, a typical architecture of that big, uh, big data platform. In fact, at the beginning, maybe a couple of years ago, we didn't know uh, much about uh, machine learning community, and we don't have a clear idea where to put the jobs if you're in the supercomputer or here in the big data, because it's a mix. Sometimes we need one capability, and sometimes we need another capability. I think that in the last two years, we have learned that uh, depends on the problem. If you have a problem that is mainly related to process data, you must move to the big data. If you want to make a deep learning, maybe the best one is the finish the right because you need a lot of computing capacity. So let me explain a little bit what is really a, a deep learning. This is a, um, a nice definition of what I understand that is a machine learning is in red. This is a definition from Michel that say that a computer basically uh, is an algorithm that learns from the experience to uh, create or perform attacks with uh, something that you can measure to check the performance of the system. Uh, what's this means? Well, the first thing is what is attacks. Attacks can be many different things depending on the problem that you want to solve. Can be a classification that is really one of the key uh, tags in machine learning today and deep learning. That, for example, in this case, you have these digits and you want to know exactly which is one. And uh, you use some one algorithm to say, well, this is the number eight because it's almost uh, an eight. Visually, you are a human and you can recognize there that it's an eight, but you must learn to the computer to say this is an eight and not an six, okay? But you have many other uh, tasks, like the regression, for example, is to make a, a function to approximate one value, or to make the automatic translation, or to detect anomalies, or many other different tasks. Performance is something that, is, as I said before, is something to measure the goodness of your system, yeah, of the system or your algorithm. For example, in case of regression, you can use the mean square error, the distance between the prediction that you are uh, producing using the algorithm for the value that you are looking for, and the real value. Or in case, case of classification, for example, one of them is accuracy. That is the number of times that I have the right answer in a set of values. And what is experience? This is the most important part. Really, experience is the set of data that you have plus the training. This means the process to give, to get the final parameters of the algorithm. And to do training, just in the previous presentation, they, they have a, a very nice the division between supervised and unsupervised learning. In fact, there are many four techniques one of them is supervised. When I have a set of data with the results and I want to mix uh, both of them, unsupervised when I have the set of data and, but I don't have the final answer to classify, for example, this data. And we have something that is a mix between supervised and unsupervised. And in the last years, we have another method that is reinforcing. And in this case, the computer can interact with the system after a, an initial training, for example, in trying to get uh, the final decision about which is the, the best algorithm and improving interacting with the uh, computer or with an external system or even with a human that is answering, yes, this is correct, this is not correct. Okay, machine learning is not new. In fact, is uh, we can go back to the 18th uh, 18th century, when uh, they created the first uh, method, that is the least square method, that is the base, really, of many of the algorithms in, in machine learning. But I want to recognize one of the Spaniards that contributes indirectly to the system, that is uh, our novel, um, Spanish novel, Ramon y Cajal, that was the first uh, uh, scientist that discovered how this, their brain could work, uh, and uh, he uh, said that uh, the brain, the, the 
the neurons, really the most important part are the connections between the neurons. So this theory, and that you know, for them was uh, really the theory that created, that produced that he won the, the Nobel Prize, uh, was used uh, during the 80s to create the first uh, really model uh, based on connections. This means connecting, uh, using connections between the neurons or the algorithms in this case. But uh, in the 80s, we had the, the first wave of the machine learning that was almost a, 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 a something that we can say the, that failed, really, during the, uh, at the end of the 80s and, and the beginning of the 90s. Until 2006, when you have a Rambam again of the problem of the use of machine learning because, uh, because Hilton solved one of the problems of the deep learning that was there, really the training of the models. So, So why now? Because we have the capacity to produce the algorithms. We have data, plenty of data, huge amount of data. And we have the computing capacity to process all, everything. This means using this kind of algorithms with this very big amount of data. So but let me back uh, a little bit in order to understand better the kernels of the, of the system we come back a little bit uh, um, uh, to the algorithms that we have to solve in the computer science. So this is the most simple one that is the percentile, okay? And in this case, you have the, your inputs, your data, okay? and the only thing is that in this activation unit, that is the name, the nice name of, uh, of this part, to predict a value, usually you this one, this operation that is a linear regression, in fact, with some bias, and after that, you apply a function that usually is a nonlinear function. This is easy. If you have very few data, this is very easy to compute. Okay. But if you want well, <laughs> to find these, uh, these values, this W that you are inside here, because you don't know exactly the value that you must put there, okay, you must do a training that is uh, basically an optimization. You uh, start from the future, you calculate you, uh, the supervised uh, model, you calculate the difference between the predicted value and the level that you have. You create the gradient of the, of the loss that you define. That there are many uh, ways of defining loss depending on the problem that you want to, to uh, solve. And you start a loop to find the final value that you want to have in order to have a big accuracy of a big progression. This is really easy. It's really, from the computer point of view, is a typical problem of optimization. But the problem is that when you have many of them and you want to make a, in fact, a, a mess of neurons and you have one of set of activation units in one layer that is called hidden layers. In this case, you substitute the initial vectors of uh, weights for, uh, sorry, initial vector of uh, features or input layer for a matrix where you put one case per line. Imagine if you have, for example, 10,000 uh, cases, you have 10,000 lines in this case. Uh, the vector, the weights, uh, for its uh, activation unit, we have a column in a matrix. Okay? And all the features are the rows, sorry, the columns of the initial matrix. So we are com converting the initial vector product in a matrix matrix product. That is a very well-known well kernel in computer science because it's one of the most effective algorithms that we know. Of course, we have still the, the applying this function, but in this case, we have to apply the function to all the elements of the final matrix or the final vector. 
this means we have an, a vector operation that is also a very well-known um, operation in computer science. So this is nothing uh, new. Uh, and, and additionally, uh, the gradient that we have to calculate, in fact, in this kind of models, you can convert in uh, the same algorithm that you have here, but instead of going in this direction, you are going in this direction, from the back to the beginning. And the operation, more or less, that you have to do in the systems are the same. Products of matrix, matrix, applying a function to the final results in a vector or in a matrix, and vector matrix product. So we are, these are very well-known algorithms. But what's happening? The problem is that the models are deeper, deeper, and deeper. And in this case, this is one of the last uh, networks that are um, in there are one challenge uh, every year about classifying things, and Google Net, for example, presented this network. This network is very, very large. You cannot read here the parameters, but this network has several million of weights. So you have to train several of millions of weights. That means you need a very large data set in order to uh, train the system. So. What's happening? The problem is I cannot create a matrix of several million of rows for uh, several thousand of parameters of features. So it's impossible. Well, it's possible maybe, but the problem is too costly. So uh, the community has created a w the way of making this kind of gradient calculation using minibats. They divide the matrix in several small cases, instead of having millions of rows, they select only maybe 128 or 1,000 or 8,000 cases per uh, step. And this allowed to make very fast calculation without having the problem of rates that there's big matrix. Of course, they have to introduce another point, that they, it's time that they uh, make a full pass in the data set. They, um, make a random uh, change in the order of the, of, of the uh, row. So in two uh, calculus of the gradient, you don't have exactly the same data set. So this is a, the, a small introduction about, uh, in, about uh, the algorithms and the techniques. So in this situation, what's happening with HPC? Where HPC can help to deep learning? Well. Uh, we started in, in 2016 uh, with uh, Swan services based on TensorFlow because we have a, a initial demand with the initial API of TensorFlow. And as you can see that during this year, we have been very, very busy. In fact, we are now testing all these APIs from TensorFlow and Cafe that are maybe the most famous now in, in the market of the API, but there are variation of CAFE, for example, CAFE 2, that is uh, including MPI communications uh, in order to speed up the, the training or torch of CNTK for uh, Microsoft. And we started to check the performance of these APIs. The first thing that uh, we were, uh, we can help to the, to the HP, uh, sorry, to the machine learning community is in the, in the design part of the algorithm. In fact, the designing of one algorithm still is, a, is an art, I say it, because you don't know exactly the number of neurons or the number of direction units or the kind of um, nonlinear function that you want to use. So you have to find, you need to, to uh, look for these parameters in, uh, in the model. Because in the last years, there are one technique that is the transfer learning that is starting uh, to do your research. So the problem is, uh, well, I have many parameters, and usually the research in this area are making uh, a cycle, making an idea, making the calculus, uh, find an experiment, analyze, and make many, many things this look. Our idea was, of course, we can help you using HPC, running all of them in parallel. Okay, and try to find the best one. And we, we did, in a case, 
that is an industrial case, but we are developing with another two centers, one technological center and one company. The technological center is from here, from Vigo, from a, a city that is very close to, uh, to Santiago, and this is an Slovenian, a Slovenian company. The idea is to create uh, a machine learning algorithm to control a robot, a laser robot, that make the laser uh, metal deposition to repair molds, for example, or adhesives of metal. In this case, uh, the first part of the algorithm is a convolution network that uh, uh, use a very high speed camera, approximately 10,000 frames per second, in order to control exactly what's happening during the pass of the last of the laser through uh, the surface of the mold, for example, of the metal sheet. This uh, network is, uh, well, it's a typical convolutional network with, uh, in fact, two elements. That is just one that is a convolutional network with several filters and after that with a pool. The problem is how many filters and how many activations uh, you need in here in the full co uh, fully connected uh, area. Well, the idea was run everything in parallel and select the best one, the best one. And in this case, we run more than 192 models in parallel using a small set of resources, of course, at CESCA, to calculate the accuracy of, in our case, uh, of the models to select a very few set of models that can be later uh, trained deeply or can be analyzed or can be used in another, in another steps. But in this case, we could reduce 40 days of uh, work in only 72 hours, that, uh, 70 hours. Sorry. That is really a very big reduction in engineering and in time for the people waiting for results. You can download the, the report from this guy. You will go to technical reports. It's published there because it's a work of uh, Gonzalo and uh, Carmen from uh, the Fortissimo project. Well, the second point was uh, we were starting to analyze uh, the parallel training. Okay? Uh, initially, the, the first parallel uh, that you can use in our system, because it's a 20, 24 cores, is to use many cores for making, for making the, the train. And in this case, you can see the scalability in some cases is, well, it's very good. But depending on the model, the scalability can change dramatically. And maybe you can get only a few, uh, um, you can gain only using a very, a very few number of uh, cores. Uh, and after that, you, can, uh, you don't have any gain. Putting more cores is useless. Wait. If you go to, if you go to uh, see in detail what's happening in a, in a distributed parallel um, techniques, if that, in this case, you distribute, you make, for example, several copies of the same network. And usually, in some of the products like TensorFlow, for example, or CNTK, or uh, CAFE2, you, they have another process that is a parameter, a parameter server. This parameter server is really the key part of the, of the system because it calculates the full gradient per step or every several steps. And you have here the same model running in parallel. And uh, this means that you have uh, maybe in this case three copies, but you can have 100 copies of the model. And all of them training in a subset of the, final, the full data set. The second technique, useful technique, is the model parallel training. This is not so common, except maybe in Google. They have a lot of very large models that uh, the model cannot fit in a single device, for example, in a single GPU, and they can distribute the model, for example, this is not really uh, the distribution, okay? But this part of the, of the network, because it can not fit in the GPU, for example, you move this part of the network to another GPU. And for example, TensorFlow calculates automatically the flow of the data through the different devices. In this case, you have only a single model, that you train in a very large infrastructure because, for example, you can run with hundreds of GPUs, one GPU storing only a small part of the full model. Okay. But
but it's only used when you have a very huge model or, and of course, and you have a very high number of uh, devices. Well, and now there's a point, accelerators. There are many accelerators in the market and in our opinion, continuously many more accelerators. Of course, the best one, or the, well, not the best one, the, the, the accelerator that is usually known for everyone is the GPU. Okay. But uh, last year, Google uh, um, started to produce the TPU, uh, that is Tensor Pro Product Unit. Why Tensor? Do you know what a Tensor is? Write your hand, what a Tensor is? One person only, okay, two persons. Tensor is really, from, from the mathematical point of view, Tensor is something different, but uh, we can think that it's a multidimensional array. And in this case, we can uh, cope with the, we must cope with the problem of transforming our algorithms from matrix matrix to tensor tensor, because we are using more than two dimensions. So it's not so easy. We, are, we don't know exactly how to improve these algorithms now in, in computer science. And it's the base of the, of the machine learning in some techniques, like for example, the uh, recurrent networks. Or, for example, Microsoft had created a new product that is the Brainwave, that is really is a FPGA, a specialized FPGAs. In, in my opinion, we have not tested yet this, both of them, okay. But maybe uh, this one is more useful for uh, the inference part, that for the training, but uh, I'm not sure, really. So, for example, in this case, the parallel training is different depending on the software. And this is the parallel training in case of uh, CAFE. If you have several uh, GPUs, CAFE cannot go outside the node, but can use all the GPUs that you have in your system. And in, in, the, in our case, for example, we have key 80 that really, it's it, key 80 R to key 40, okay? But the communications between both of them is internal. But if you want to go to, from the GPU 0 to GPU 3, for example, you must pass through the subject. It's, you cannot go directly. Okay. In the case of CAFE, they created, in, with using four GPUs, they create this um, tree of reductions in the gradients. They start one of the GPU communicates, communicates to the to the other one, for example, this one communicates with this one. The three communicates with the two, three communicates with the two, two sent to the zero, zero calculates the gradients, and again, we have the, the opposite direction to distribute again the new, the new values of the weights. It's nice, but the problem is that it, does, it, it doesn't scale out of the node, because they are maybe going with R CUDA, we can do it out the node, but uh, currently inside we cannot. Okay. Well, this is, these are mm, many of the techniques that are in the market. The problem is that what's happening with that? And we are now testing in our platform several APIs to understand better really the performance and the, the, capabilities, of, the capabilities of these APIs. So they are preliminary, preliminary results. The first thing that uh, you can find, and initially was a surprise for us, but really is in the literature, in the, you can find papers about that, is that the accuracy depends on the resources on the byte, and the byte size. In this case, we are running with different batch sizes, and usually one and two GPUs to uh, train this model. And you can see the final accuracy is completely different. In fact, uh, if the, the batch size is very large, the initial, gradi uh, the initial gradients are very, very wide. And the train, of course, is very, very fast because you make several, these are the number of epochs. This means the number, the number of data sets that I am uh, processing for the training. But the, problem, oh, but the problem is that the, the final accuracy is not good. In fact, it's better to train with a, a small data set. Sorry, a small batch size. If you look at the in detail what's happening, in, in the last step, this is the, the train 
with 128 cases in the batch size. And this is what happened when I trained with the 2048. Of course, training with 2048 is very, very fast. We will see later, but the problem is that we are losing 2% in accuracy. That is a lot in this kind of models. This is, these are the times, of course. We have a very big case. Uh, our computers can work, cope with these very big matrices, but the problem, well, right now, uh, you have a certain spin up, spin up, and you can see that this is with, with one GPU, this is with two GPUs. When we increase the batch size, the performance of the GPU is better, and in this case, we decrease the time. The uh, main uh, trick, increase at the same time that you increase the batch size, increase the learning rate. And we tried to do it. Uh, we have some improvements at the beginning, but still the, the problem of the dependency of the final accuracy with the batch size is still there. So we, we are learning how to cope with this problem and how to solve this, this issue. I back again to the, to the timing. Of course, uh, as we can, uh, if you work in HPC, you know that depending on the workload that you have, you have a one speed up. And this is the same. If I have a very small data set, that size, sorry, the speed up between using one of two GPUs is not very good. When I increase the batch size, I have a peak here when the performance of the using of the two GPUs is very, very good. But after that, the performance decreases. Okay. So it's tricky to select also the batch size that you need, depending on the hardware that they're using, okay, as in you know, the other kind of problems that we have in HPC. But be careful. This is something that we don't know exactly what's happened there. But we can reproduce the same error in TensorFlow and in Cafe. And I said that depending on the GPU, that we have internal communications. In, in case that I use the same GPUs that are in the same socket in the, in the same board, the, the performance, the accuracy is very, very bad at the same number of epochs. And in case that using uh, two different boards, this is the zero and zero two, the accuracy is almost the same. This is something that is uh, strange for us, but uh, maybe some error in the software or in, in one of the configurations that we have, but this is something that you must uh, look at. The, you must look at the results. Uh, it's not only a, a, a printing of performance, it's printing of the result. The results here are the most important part. What's happening if we compare the, tensor, uh, the, uh, the CPUs with the GPUs? Because usually the people working in, in um, in convolutional uh, networks uh, say, okay, I need a GPU. Well, it's not all the time true. This is uh, AlexNet is a convolutional network. It's famous convolutional network. And you can see here the speed up, well, exactly the number of examples per second that we, I can process depending on the resources that I have. This is with one core and this is with 25. Four cores, and you, if you compare the number of examples with 24 cores, it's exactly the same of uh, one GPU. Of course, if I use in two GPUs, I double the number of examples. So maybe you have to revisit sometime uh, the performance of your system in order to select which is the best one. But don't think that you need always a GPU. We have 300 nodes, and we have only four nodes with GPUs. So Maybe it's faster if you go and ask for 24 cores. Another issue is related with the versions. This is Cafe versus uh, Cafe Intel. Intel uh, has released a version of Cafe that is, an, they say, that is improved version for uh, their own uh, chips. And if I believe this data, <laughs> You can see that really they have done a very good work uh, in improving uh, CAFE. These are the results of CAFE that, in fact, it has a very limited scalability when uh, you use one, uh, when you use only cores. But it has a very good performance in GPUs. But the problem, well, not the problem, the, the, the uh, CAFE Intel version is 
very, very, very good. And in fact, it has a very good scalability. And finally, the, the performance of 24 cores is again for CAFE equivalent to use one GPU. And finally, we study the influence of the storage. What's happening? Because we have three different storage. We, can, we have the local disks, we have a last default system, and we have another permanent storage that is connected by ENFs. So which is the storage that we need for making the training? Well, uh, these are the scalability of the, in, case, in this case, of Cafe Intel using uh, CPUs and not GPUs. And when I use a very small number of CPUs, of course, more or less, the results are the same. However, when I have a very large number of CPUs, this means that I can process the information very, very fast. In this case, the disk is really important to have a very good scalability in the system. These are the loose default system for the fully connected and for the AlexNet, and this is the other storage that we have and you can see a difference in the performance. So if I have a conclusion here is if you have a very large data set and you have a NAS computer resource, go to the faster file system that you have in order to allow the, the CPUs to process all the information on time. Well, so after the results, what are the, con the conclusions? Well, machine learning and HPC really are good friends because many of the algorithms that are used in the machine learning community are in the in the other products and other applications that we have in the in the HPC since many years and are there and we have had a good performance of them. HPC clearly can help in the initial design of the models because we can run several models in parallel without problem of resources and try to find the initial model for uh, really work on the tail, okay? reducing a lot the initial time to find the correct model. Of course, HPC can help uh, training because uh, we have large and fast storage because, because we can use uh, several CPUs or several nodes even to uh, speed up your training you can, we can add accelerators if you need it in, in our machines, but it's not a, a paradise. <laughs> but you said it's not a paradise. Um, we have still some problem, some issues with the Slurm because the Slurm you can ask for a couple of GPUs, for example, in one machine, but you cannot ask for these two GPUs in this machine at least in our version. Uh, maybe it's an improvement for the future uh, because of, you can see that depending on the placement of the uh, processes, we can have a completely different uh, efficiency. You must have the correctness of the results always. Clearly, I have shown that, okay, of course, I have a very good speed up, but the results have, has, has almost no sense, so uh, this is something important. And uh, you must uh, learn how to cope with the differences that uh, are producing to, because you are using a stochastic rating algorithm in your system. And it's important to take into account when you are making a parallel training or you are, making, or you are using different kind of uh, parameters for speed up the training. And finally, really, uh, I cannot do everything. <laughs> so. I have to uh, give uh, my thanks to these people that have been working hard during the last uh, months to, to create these things. Starting for Gonzalo and Carmen, that they, they did all the hyperparametric search. Uh, Ricardo, Vicky, and Jose, that were, that were three students that were working, uh, porting the DL Bench, that is the software that they're using to make these uh, benchmarks to our system. Of course, to my department, the application department at Sega, that they have done, they have installed uh, a lot of APIs in a very few days. And uh, Sega, of course, for providing me the resources. And that's all. Thank you.